As we're talking about how not to fail, how not to fail, we are more likely going to have victory when we use the tools and resources that God has given us. And there are all kinds of those, but briefly, let me just read from Ephesians chapter 6. And many of you will know what this is. This is what's called typically the armor of God. And I'm going to start uh, in chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take, up, uh, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the Spirit with prayer and supplication. So I, I think the, a really great thing for us to practice each day is to say, I'm going to be strong in you, God, today. I, I am going to cover, you, cover myself with you. So thank you, God, for covering me today. You're covering me with these things we just talked about. You're covering me with truth. I will listen to your voice, God, going forward, not the lies of the enemy. And we know that your word is truth, as Jesus said. God, I, I'm being covered with your righteousness. So when I wake up, I'm covered with Jesus and his righteousness, and I will walk in that righteousness today. Thank you for that, God. God, I, I'm covering myself with your readiness. I'm standing on your truth, and I am ready to share the good news of the peace that we can have with you through Jesus, the peace that we can have with each other, even with creation, because of Jesus. I'm ready to do that. Thank you, God, for covering me with the readiness of Jesus. God, thank you for covering me with faith so that when the enemy attacks, uh, my, that faith is going to absorb those attacks and extinguish them. God, thank you for covering me with salvation, assurance that I am saved because of Jesus so I have life here on earth and I have life forever with you. And God, thank you that I can be covered with communion with you, communication with you by praying to you. Now, all of those are important. All of those resources are really important. <clears throat> but today, we're going to focus on the idea of prayer. Today, we're going to focus on the idea of prayer. So, we're going to read in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 7 through 13. And this is, um, we'll get to it in just a second. So if you want to turn there, Matthew chapter 6. This is something Jesus taught us very, very powerfully. For uh, this idea, for prayer, uh, we really encourage you to read a book called Prayer and Fasting by David Roadcup and Michael Eagle. It's available online. Uh, again, at Amazon, uh, you can also get it from Christian Book. Um, there are places you can pick it up, but if you're in the building and you still don't have a copy, there are a few copies out at the table that also has the Core 52 books available. The, the prayer and fasting book is free. Um, when we're out, we'll be out for the day, but um, a lot of you already have it. But please pick that up if you want to really dig in to praying and learning what it means maybe to fast a little bit more. In the section on prayer, which is actually the smaller of the two sections in the book, there are resources there. Uh, it, it gives us a list of reasons that we should pray, and it unpacks those for us. It talks about hindrances to our prayer, and we know that that is a thing, right? That is not just uh, an, uh, something that's nebulous. That is a reality. There are things that happen when you begin to pray that make it challenging to continue to pray. It talks about developing a prayer life. So there are all kinds of helpful resources in that book. And it says this, when there is a lack of prayer, there will be an absence of power. When there's a lack of prayer, there will be an absence of power, which means we win, we have victory when we use the resource God has given us called prayer. The first message 
of the year, typically here at Discover, is about prayer. I want to go back three years. Let's go in our way back machine, okay? For three years, we're going to go back to January 2020. Some of you know what happened in 2020, right? January 2020, our message was called Vision Fuel. And the overall statement was this. If we want to catch God's vision for Discover and for our lives, we need to do what Jesus did in Luke chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. Listen to what Jesus did in Luke 5, 15 and 16. The news about Jesus spread even more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. So Jesus is making an impact. His ministry is going really, really well. And and all these people are coming and wanting to hear and wanting to be fed physically, spiritually, wanting to have their lives changed. And this is what it says right after that. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So that was our focus for the day. A few weeks later, a thing called COVID-19 made all of us go to lonely places. We were forced into these lonely, isolated places. And as I look back, I have to ask myself, did I do what Jesus did? When Jesus went to be alone, he spent time with God. He prayed. He fasted. And and I look back and I think, how much of that did I do when I was forced to be alone? Or did other things creep in instead? Well, Jesus prayed a lot. Jesus prayed a lot. And when his disciples said, Jesus, teach us how to pray, He gave them this model. You've heard this multiple times. It's from Matthew chapter 6. And today I'm using the English Standard Version. Jesus says this, When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. That's a simple, powerful example of a prayer. I want to just quickly share three acronyms that might help you, might help me as we are praying. These are things that can help guide our prayers. So, first one is this, ACTS. A lot of you have probably heard of this one. Um, the, the, a, the acronym is adoration. So you say, God, thank you. I praise you. Um, I just honor you for who you are. Then confession, which is to say, God, these are things in my life that I need to, to, to say, please forgive me for these things. And, and God, I want to change. Please change me in those areas. The third thing is thanksgiving, to just say, God, thank you for all the blessings that I have in my life, and you can start listing them. Uh, It can take a long time to do that, Um, but just thank God for the things in your life that are such a blessing. And then supplication is kind of a fancy word to simply say, pray, to, to ask. You just say, God, on behalf of myself, or on behalf of my friend, on behalf of my neighbor, what, on behalf of the leaders of our nation, whatever it is, God, I am praying for this. So acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. It's a great model. Here's another one. This one has been gaining a lot of traction recently. Very similar. This one is pray, and you start with praise, saying, God, again, I praise you, I adore you. Then second, I repent. Same kind of thing as confession, right? I, I, repentance is simply a biblical word that means to turn around, to do, do a 180, So God, I I was walking in this direction in this area of my life. I need to walk toward you instead. I need to repent. Then asking, again, a simple word for supplication, right? I'm, I'm asking you, God, for these things. And then I like this when it says yield. God, I'm praying about this, but not my will, but yours be done, as Jesus prayed, right? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in my own life. So... 
That's another good acronym you can use. So act and pray. And here's another one that's pretty new, to me at least. It's called push. Pray until something happens. (laughs) Now, to be super honest, we're like, oh, that's not a very spiritual thing. But Jesus said in Luke chapter 18, he said, listen, you should pray and never give up. So it's pretty spiritual to keep praying until something happens. Well, anyway, uh, the main thing is to remember to simply pray and to pray simply. Simply pray and pray simply. No matter how you pray, no matter how you pray, another spiritual practice can enhance your prayer life. This was nearly lost, but is being rediscovered. It's kind of like maybe your great-grandmother had this recipe for bread that was unbelievable, but she never wrote it down. And then she died. And that recipe was lost. And your family has been like, oh, if only we could have great-grandma's bread. And then, in a book, someone finds the recipe. It's like, wow, we've got grandma's recipe for the bread. This is a little bit like what's happening today. There's a spiritual practice that was almost lost, at least to the Western church, and and we have not been practicing it. And I grew up in the church, and many of you I've talked to you, this is something that was really not talked about, and I'm sorry that we haven't talked about it in the way that we should have. And this spiritual practice is fasting. Richard Foster in... 1978 wrote a book called Celebration of Discipline. One of the quotes from the book is this. I could not find a single book published on the subject of Christian fasting from 1861 to 1954. 93 years of lost opportunities to grow. Now, this passage where Jesus was just teaching people, this is how you should pray, Right after he talks about prayer, he talks about fasting. And this is what he says. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, so their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So Jesus says, when you fast, when you fast. Now, fasting is not an absolute command, but fasting is an absolute blessing. And our motivation for fasting is important. This is spiritual fasting. This isn't a thing you do to lose weight or some kind of cleanse or something like that. We're talking about spiritual fasting. Here are some reasons to fast and reasons not to fast. So let's start with the not. The first one Jesus talked about was don't do it to show off spiritually. Oh, yes, I fast. I'm so hungry. I've been fasting for 46 days. I went beyond Jesus. Don't do stuff like that. Don't brag about your fasting. That doesn't mean people can't know that you're fasting. You might want to have a reason for people to know that you're fasting. We'll talk about that in a second. You also shouldn't fast so that you can manipulate God and say, well, God, I've been fasting, so now you're going to have to give me that money. You're going to have to give me that house, that car, that phone, that significant other I've been praying about. Or or trying to earn something from God. I'm just going to fast because I want to gain God's love. I want to gain God's acceptance or attention or salvation. Those things are things that God offers you not because you fast, but because he created you. So those are some reasons not to fast. There are others. And again, these are listed in the book for you, um, including some others. Uh, Here are some reasons to fast. Again, in the book, there are 11 reasons that are given. But let me just give you a summary statement. As we develop an overview of the biblical concept of fasting, here's what we should understand. So one statement is the reason to fast. At its root, fasting is taking something highly significant to us and deciding to lay it aside or postpone it temporarily for a spiritual purpose. Fasting is spiritually, mentally, and physically restorative, and fasting brings power to prayer. 
great reason to fast. Your prayer life will accelerate when you fast. So let's talk briefly about types of fasting. Again, this is new to most of us. There are a variety of fasts that you can do. Here are the two most common. One is just called the normal fast. It's the the one where you just say, I'm not going to have any food or any drink of any caloric value for a certain amount of time. That's the typical fast. And that can be uh, a meal. It can be a day, a couple days, whatever it happens to be. The partial fast says, I am going to abstain from only certain types of foods or drinks. And I'm still going to eat other things, but these are the things I'm, I'm giving up during this season, during this time of fasting. Um, and then you still eat and drink other things. You can fast from things besides food or drink. You can fast from media. Imagine that. You can fast from sports. You might want to for the next week or so. You can fast from your phone. For some people, that's harder than going without food. You can fast from anything. You can fast individually, just by yourself. Again, Jesus says that's a good thing to do. You can also fast, again, not to publicize it, but to say, hey, let's fast together or Um, would you at least hold me accountable for this? You can do that as a group, your life group or your discipleship group. You can do it as a group of friends. You can do it with your family. Um, We're asking everybody as a church to say yes to fasting. So you can do it as a group. So those are some kind of the logistical, pragmatic things about fasting. And again, you need to be careful if, if you have certain types of medical conditions. The book covers all of that kind of stuff. Don't just go haphazardly into fasting. Well, Jesus fasted 40 days, I'm in. You know, that's not what we're talking about. But we benefit, we benefit spiritually when we fast. And that's kind of the question, why should I try fasting? I mean, what difference does it make? Well, Jesus, right after he was baptized, he went into the wilderness. And if you remember back in August, we talked about how the wilderness is not necessarily a place of weakness, but it's a place of strength. It's a place of, again, being isolated, being separated, focusing on your time with God. So Jesus went into the wilderness, and he fasted, and after that, Jesus started his ministry. And you can read about that in Luke chapter 4. And a couple chapters later, Jesus goes off again, and instead of fasting this time, he spends dedicated time, an evening it sounds like, all night in prayer. And after that, Jesus chooses the 12 Apostles, the 12 disciples that he said, I want you to follow me, and I'm going to teach you what it means to be a follower, to be a disciple. Now, you might say, well, that didn't work out very well. <laughs> I mean, come on, Jesus, you, you spent, you, maybe you should have fasted for 40 days about the disciples, because I've seen some of the stuff they did, some of the stuff they said, uh, and at the cross, only John was there, and they are kind of like a failure, wasn't it? Well, seems like it at first, and then you look at the long term. The reason we are here is because those disciples not just the 12, but the others who were following Jesus, got it. Once Jesus resurrected and the Holy Spirit came, they understood. And that's the only reason we are gathered today. So no, it wasn't a failure. By the way, another sidebar. Um, Not endorsing everything about it, but The Chosen is a pretty cool video series that just kind of walks through the, the ministry of Jesus while he's here on earth. And you get a really... Uh, kind of an inside view of what it must have been like to be one of those disciples. And you can see their flaws and as they're working through their lives. And here's the thing. As we look at our own lives, we go, oh, yeah, I'm not perfect either, am I? But our goal is to place ourselves where God can change us. We just take one step towards Jesus together. So as we're thinking about fasting, 
Let me just share briefly. In our discipleship group, over the last couple of months, we read the prayer and fasting book, and then we each implemented um, a, a time of fasting, and we each did it differently. And I asked the guys in the group, I said, hey, can you just send me some quick bullet points? Um, so let me share some of the things that were uh, mentioned. The prayer and fasting book showed me a new old tool to draw me closer to God, one I should have been using more often. Fasting gave my prayer life a new and better focus. It was difficult to keep from looking at fasting as spiritual extortion. Hey God, I did this difficult thing for you, now give me what I want. I recognized how all-consuming food is. In the U.S., food is easy to get, and it's all around me. Fasting taught me more about what hunger is like. A hunger for food helped grow my hunger for God. I had never fasted for developing and growing my faith. My prayer life has grown by implementing this spiritual practice. Being a diabetic, going without food would not be good for my health. So I decided to give up diet soda during my work day. And I set aside the last 15 minutes of my lunch each day with no distractions or interruptions, which allowed for prayer just to listen or to read the Bible. And here are some thoughts from the group about fasting going forward. Weekly, I plan to fast from a meal to pray for special requests, growth, or repentance. I desire to make fasting a more regular part of my life. I plan to do this again at the start of the new year to see where the Holy Spirit could possibly lead. There's a discussion guide that goes with the book, and in it, Michael Eagle writes this. We live in a society of abundance, and fasting is not a priority. Yet fasting was not intended as an if, but a when. Fasting positions us for a process of continual communication with the Father through prayer. Jesus modeled this for us. Fasting was given to us by God as a gift. What could be more fulfilling than having a constant, deep communion with the living God? Psalm 42, 1 and 2 says this, As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Prayer and fasting helps to satisfy our spiritual hunger, our, our hunger and thirst for God. But here's what's pretty cool. Wonderfully and mysteriously, it also creates an even greater hunger and thirst for God. And that's a good thing. In fact, that's a healthy thing. I mean, just think of it in terms of any healthy relationship. We get to know each other by spending time together. And as that relationship grows, there's also a desire to be together more. That's the same kind of thing that's happening here. How many of you eat just one meal a week? Raise your hand if you eat one meal a week. Not if you eat one, but just one. Do you ever think, well, if I eat more than one meal a week, I don't think I'll want food anymore? No, that meal satisfies you for that period of time, right? But it doesn't diminish your desire to eat again. And to be spiritually healthy, we must be nourished by God more than one time per week. Just as physical food uh, is nourishing to us, we are spiritually satisfied only when we are with God on a daily basis. So we need to make a commitment as we walk into this new year and say, God, I want to make sure that I'm spending time with you consistently, being nourished by you, by your word, by your spirit, by my encouragement with others, by sharing the good news, by putting my faith into action. Now, if you're like me, um, when you come to a monumental time like January 1st every year, there's this big thing that's just looming in front of you where you have to look back at the previous year and look forward to the next year, right? Anybody like still feel like, oh no, I didn't keep my resolutions, you know, all that kind of junk. 
chill out, okay? But here's the thing. I look back sometimes at not just this past year, but I look back at my, my last few decades of life, and I'm like, ah, if I would have done this, it would have been so much better. And when I think of fasting, I'm like, I fasted a couple times in college, and then there was like this huge gap. Why didn't I do that more? Ah. Well, you've probably heard this. When is the best time to plant a tree? 30 years ago. When's the second best time to plant a tree? Right now. Today. So as we're talking about prayer and fasting or spending time with God, don't get concerned about the past. Satan wants to keep you stuck there. God wants you to move forward into the next thing. So today is a perfect time to start. So that's why we're going to implement a quick action plan. So as you walked in, you should have gotten a card when you picked up your communion. You should have gotten a card. If you didn't, don't worry about it. Get one on your way out. This card is your action plan. So last night, after the field goal miss, um, many of you turned over real quick and watched the ball drop or whatever, right? And the thing that happens at New Year's is there's this three, two, one. You count down, right? 1097. So we're going to use three, two, one as our action plan as we enter this new year. Now, the first thing you need to do is decide, is this for today? Meaning this week, sorry. Is this for this week or this month? Am I going to do this for the week of January 1st, or am I doing it for the month of January? So you'll need to figure that out. And you don't need to fill this out right now because I want you to, I mean, you can, but if you're thinking, I'm not totally sure, spend a little time with it, but don't just set it aside and then be done with it, okay? So the first thing is three. Three times I will pray. Now this isn't, you know, I'm going to pray as I eat my meals, or I'm going to pray as I wake up in the morning necessarily, These are dedicated times in your calendar, in your schedule, that are set aside for prayer. Like, maybe not to the extent as Jesus went away and prayed all night, but it's that kind of idea. These are specific, dedicated times that you will put into your calendar. Three times, either this week or this month, that I will spend in dedicated prayer. And again, you can use those acronyms. You can use things that you get from the prayer and fasting book, whatever, to guide you. You can to walk through the Lord's prayer and make that personal, whatever you want to do. Three times you will do that. Two things to pray about. And you might think, oh, I have so many things to pray about. Think of two. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead you to two things that are really important right now. It might be something in your relationship with God or your relationship with a person. It might be someone you're praying for that they would walk more closely with Jesus or encounter Jesus for the first time. It might be something with, again, leadership of our country, of our city, or something like that for our church. Whatever these things are, pray for two specific things and then keep praying for them over and over and over during that prayer time. The one is one time you will fast. Again, whether it's this week or this month. I'm going to fast at least once this month. And you'll need to be um, deciding how you're going to do that. Like a specific plan for that and a specific length of time that you will do it. So all of that you're going to write down. So again, it's available on this card. And then on the back... You have the acronyms, and you also have the information about the book we've been talking about. So use this card for your action plan. Use the book for your action plan. And one other thing, tell somebody, somebody you trust, somebody that will hold you accountable but not beat you up over it, tell them your action plan. And I'm assuming if you're telling them yours, maybe they will tell you theirs, maybe not. But find someone who will encourage you. You're probably wondering why this tea has been here the whole time. It's not because my throat gets messed up, although it does. Let's make a point. So I'm going to make some tea now. Yeah, it's long enough. kind of a difference between these two, right? 
I mean, I put the tea bag in both of them. But one of them had longevity and consistency. And I think sometimes when we think of prayer or fasting, we think, well, I did that. Nothing happened. Every day we say, God, cover me. God, let me spend time with you. Let me be immersed, if you will, in your presence, God. And over time, as I keep doing this, my, my spiritual life will be richer. The transformation that you make in my life from this to this is going to be more pronounced. I'll be stronger and I'll be more satisfied. God, I need you. And then we need to say, not just with our words, we need to, to express it with our actions. That we will spend time with God daily. And when we do that, God will work in us, God will work through us, and this coming year will be blessed. Might be different than the way we see it right now, but when we spend time in God's presence, it will be blessed. So how not to fail? Immerse yourself in God's presence and stay there.